Your Excellencies, Ambassadors of Brazil, Mexico, diplomatic representatives from Colombia and other Latin American embassies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to this uh, conference on regional reactions to the rise of Brazil. This is the second now in conferences which the Australian National Centre for Latin American Studies has held, which we've titled in a somewhat literary, perhaps even poetic way, The Shifting Sands of Global Power in Latin America. And the reason for this rather flowery title uh, for our conferences is that we wanted to make a, a couple of points in this country, in Australia, about Latin America, because Australia has historically had rather slim relationships with Latin America. And it's only recently that people have started to notice that things are changing there and relationships have started to develop further. The first is that the changes that have taken place in Latin America, the shifting sands, if you like, of global power, is not only affecting the lives of some perhaps 560 million people in the region, but also affecting relationships in the broader world between states, between peoples, economically and politically. And these involved economic growth, this last period of a decade or a decade and a half in Latin America has been one of the best periods overall of economic growth for Latin America in perhaps a century or so. And of course there have been major political changes with still imperfect democracies in many places there's nevertheless been a consolidation of democratic practices in the region and this has changed the lives of people there but also the way in which other countries interact with Latin America. And nowhere I think in Latin America have these changes been more remarked upon than in Brazil. Brazil uh, the giant, Brazil uh, blessed with the bounty of minerals in a world which is hungry for minerals, potentially great oil wealth and of course uh, with great agricultural potential as well. And for someone from Australia, and one of the things that's always commented on is that Brazil has no shortage of water at all. And Brazil's rise is matched by an attempt for it to play a greater role, not just regionally, but to see itself as playing a greater role internationally as well. But one of the things I think we want to do in these next two days of this conference is to illustrate that no rise, if you like, of any country in history is without friction. It does not create problems, both domestically in terms of adjusting to a new kind of position in the world, a new structure of the economy, but also internationally. Uh, its regional partners react to that rise and internationally in terms of global fora and great power politics. And in order to analyse that, uh, to look at it and to deal with the problems as well as the rise of Brazil, we're very fortunate to have assembled a very distinguished panel of speakers from Latin America, the United States, the UK and Australia. A couple of thanks. First of all, it wouldn't have been possible to assemble that panel of speakers for you over the next two days without the generous support of the, and I have to read this because it's a very complicated name, Department of Industry, Innovation, Science, Research and Tertiary Education. Uh, and in particular, I'd like to thank Christina Brancia for her help uh, in securing that financial support. I'd also like to thank the Embassy of Brazil in Australia and the Ambassador, Mr. Ruben Barbosa, for his continuing support for this conference and for the Australian National Centre for Latin American Studies in many, many things that we do. In advance, I'd also just like to thank uh, two people who've put a great deal of administrative work into the conference, Claudia Viejas, uh, who is the Anklis Administrator, and Lucy Foot Short, uh, who sets things up for us in a very efficient way for these conferences. But particularly, uh, the driving force of the conference has been Sean Burgess, who's uh, a Brazilianist himself, an energetic person in organising things like this, and a great uh, pillar of Anklis at this university. And I'm now going to call on Sean to introduce the themes, I think, of the conference. Thank you. Okay, thank you again, John. And um, I, let me re reiterate uh, my, my thanks to the Australian government uh, and Christina's help getting the funding for the conference, to Ambassador Barbosa for the support, and particularly to Claudia Villegas and uh, Lucy Foot Short. So anybody who's organized one of these things, you know how much work goes in and how difficult it can be. And I can say that it's been almost effortless for me because of, of the work of Claudia and, and Lucy. Um, give you a, a 
quick little logistical note about the, the way we're going to work. We're going to go roughly on 45 minute sessions per speaker. It's about 20 minutes for the speaker to present their, their argument and their, and their material and then we'll go with about 20-25 minutes of, of discussion afterwards. Uh, so sort of a, we'll work through paper by paper in a sense. Go with about 30 minute coffee breaks after every two speakers roughly. Um, now lunch for the speakers is covered. Um, if anybody else wants to join us, um, that, you know, if you take care of your bill you can join us. You're more than welcome to. Um, and other than that, we have tea and coffee, more or less on tap, out, outside. Um, and the last logistical detail, which I think everybody knows, is the facilities are located just out in the, uh, the foyer. Um, all right, so where did this conference come from? Um, a couple of years ago, I published a book on Brazilian foreign policy. It's titled Brazilian Foreign Policy After the Cold War, but it comes out of a a PhD thesis that looked at Brazilian leadership in South America at a time when uh, most people in Brasilia really, they, they got almost uh, an allergic reaction to the use of the word leadership with Brazil. And one of the comments that came back from the reviewers was, well, it's all nice and good that you've said that Brazil is doing this and you've demonstrated how it may or may not be working and what is going on, but how are the other countries responding? And sort of, I thought that's a valid question. It's another book, another project, um, one that far escapes me. And so what this conference is, in a sense, is it's a chance to ask that question. Because we, we know that Brazil has risen. We know that Brazil has a massive influence throughout the region. But we're, not many people have devoted uh, particular attention to how other countries are reacting to Brazil and what implications this is having, particularly within South America. The, all of the rising power talk at the moment seems to be Brazil and the global system, but not Brazil and what's happening in South America and Latin America. So, that, that's the idea here, is to get this, a group of experts on individual subject areas and countries and have them talk about uh, the specific aspects of what's going on with Brazil. And so what I'm going to do right here is essentially summarize sort of the main arguments in the book that I had and, and put forward the case that Brazil has risen and it has quite a strong presence and quite a strong influence throughout Latin America, sort of to set the background against which the other papers can respond. Okay. So the first idea is Brazil is leader. Is Brazil actually... Um, can be seen as an actual leader in any kind of you know reasonable sense, and there's a number of factors that, that give you give you a good re you know reason for saying that Brazil actually is a leader. Um, the first one would be just the sheer size of the country. It's huge, and, and we forget about that to a certain extent. But it is it's of continental dimensions. It's also centrally positioned. If you look at the map of South America, it's right in the middle. Now, population distribution is a different question, but it's right in the center of everything. So it's difficult not to think about Brazil when you think about many regional issues. It has an enormous maritime border, which has big implications for the South Atlantic. Uh, and it has, and this is the, the, the kicker, this is what makes Brazil really particularly interesting. It has 10 land borders. Um, and I don't think, the ambassador can correct me, I think there's no other country that has more. Maybe Russia would be it, that has more land borders, possibly China. Um, more particularly with the Brazilian case, the land borders were all settled through peaceful negotiation, not by war. Um, so there's a very different historical context. Uh, people that like to work with Kantian theories of peace love to work with South America because they say, look, it proves if you have democracy, you don't have war, overlooking the complete lack of uh, historical tradition for that. Um, another aspect why Brazil, you can think of Brazil as being a leader, is the size of the economy. It's uh, depending on the exchange rate, fifth, sixth, seventh in the world. 2.4, 2.5 trillion dollar economy. Um, and the makeup of the economy is particularly important. So it's not like, uh, say, a Chinese economy, which is 30% dependent on import exports, the Australian, or the Chilean one, which is a much, much higher percentage. Um, only about 11% of Brazil's GDP is coming from exports. So as high as those numbers might be, and when people talk about China being Brazil's most important export partner, when you put it in a larger context, it's actually not that important. Brazil's got such a big internal economy, it can keep things driving itself. And this matters in terms of economic integration and economic linkages. Because Brazil becomes a bit of an import sink. It's an, as I'm going to show in a little bit, it's an enormously important import market for South America, which makes it commercially and economically vital for the region. Um, it's a fiscally stable country. It's a country which has a, a national development bank that's loaning more money every year than all of the international development banks combined. And uh, most of this has to be used to advance Brazil, but the way they've interpreted that, it's now used to fund foreign direct investment in projects in other countries. Uh, finally, security threats. So Brazil wants to be a world power. Um, ten years on, 
They still haven't decided what kind of advanced fighter jet they're going to buy. Um, there's a program to develop nuclear submarines by, you ready for this? 2046. So there's not, a, there's a sense that you need the military force, there's no pressing reason to have it. So it's being pursued, but not aggressively. Um, this is good for making relations with neighbors. They're not worried about being invaded. Now, when we talk about non-traditional security threats, narco-trafficking, crime, some of the environmental questions, it gets a bit more complicated. And then the final one, and this is particularly important with Brazil as a leader and how Brazil manages to position itself, is it's their foreign service. Um, the quality of the diplomats are, is pretty much unparalleled in the world. They are at the top tier with it. You know, any top tier listing, you'll find the Brazilians there. The same thing with their economists, their technocrats in the central bank and the finance ministry, uh, their technocratic officials um, and scientists in places like Embrapa, the agriculture research group. Huge technical capacity which is leveraged to, to do all sorts of things. So one of the things that you find then in Brazil's historical trajectory is that Brazil leading integration efforts. And we can go all the way back to the Mercosur Trade Pact, which was uh, launched with the 1991 uh, Treaty of Asuncion, which didn't really kick in until fully until 1995. And that had a transformative impact on the economies in the southern cone. You suddenly had this nice big internal market, uh, which allowed rapid industrialization uh, between Argentina, Brazil, and sort of Paraguay and Uruguay. Now, the situation right now is a little bit different. Mercosur is having, uh, I don't think teething pains is quite the right, right word. It's, it's in a state of almost internal warfare. Um, with all sorts of trade barriers between Brazil and between Argentina, you have the political suspension of Paraguay, which will be talked about later on. You have the entry of Venezuela in, which to have uh, Chavez, when he was first invited into Mercosur, said that I'm going to save this bloc from its neoliberal trajectory and turn it into a proper socialist integrationist movement. You've got some definite internal tensions there, but what is certain is that it's here to stay. It's not going anywhere, even if we don't recognize what, how it'll look and if it's going to take a different form. And it's something the Brazilians use to manage parts of the region. Now, going back as far as the 1980s, you find talk of some sort of a South American free trade area, South American integrationist movement. This picks up a lot internally inside uh, the government circles in the 1990s when the free trade area of the Americas was su suggested. And so there were attempts to get some sort of a South American trade bloc going. And the fa first way they looked at that was to get Mercosur to merge with the Andean community, to get some kind of an agreement between the two. You know, six, seven, eight years of negotiation, nothing much happens. As frustration mounts in the uh, 1990s, an altogether technocratic approach is taken. So in 2000, and this is one of the key moments in, in Brazilian leadership ambitions in, in South America, there's a summit held about this time in the year in Brasilia uh, that brought together for the first time all of the presidents of all of the South American countries. And they talked about infrastructure integration. They talked about making what they called axes of infrastructure. That, that's the, the yellow lines that you see up on the map. So you've got that yellow band with a red line running through the middle of it. And the idea is you find natural poles of economic growth and you build these corridors of transportation, information technology, and energy infrastructure between these different poles. Um, and this essentially was taking the Avanza Brazil model for developing, the Cardoso had for developing Brazil and applying it on a continental scale. Now, for me, what I've always found interesting about this is if you look at it, it turns into a bit of a spider web pattern with Brazil kind of in the middle. And if you've watched through, so what has happened with this? You have gas development in Bolivia, which channels to Brazil. You had Chavez talking about uh, the Anel Energetico, an energy ring, again, focused on the Brazil market. You have electricity supply from Paraguay into Brazil, and they're now talking about Bolivia and Peru having hydro dams to supply Brazil. Uh, in uh, Venezuela, a new dam was uh, built, dam was built uh, in the 1990s. Again, a good chunk of that power went to Brazil. Transportation linkages. This idea of a trans-Andean transportation corridor to get Brazilian products directly to the Pacific coast and then on to Asia has been a massive carrot being dangled in front of the Andean countries for the last you know, 12 years. Nobody's talked much about the economics of taking soya by truck over the Andes, but you know, the, the argument is still there. From the IRSA, you get this idea of a technocratic approach to it. So you sort of depoliticize things a bit. You take away the contentious bit about who's going to build what where and, and trade balances. And you get people talking about concrete projects that seem to make sense. And then with the advent of the Lula administration, you get a, a, a repoliticization um, because, you know, you've got a, a, a new government in place. They want to relabel things so that they can take credit for it, even if they continue on with more or less the same programs. Uh, standard politics. It's, we've seen this everywhere. 
and they start to push the political dimension. So you'd have it first, and I think it was 2004, you have uh, the CSN or, or CASA, depending which acronym you want to use, Community of South American Nations, which kind of stutters along a bit until it's transformed into what we now know as UNASUR, which is an altogether more political beast. But this again gets into the idea of Brazilian leadership. So it's not necessarily going to do much on the trade front, but on the political front. If there's a problem in South America, where is it talked about now? And that's interesting. It's not talked about at the OAS in Washington. The UNISOR leaders meet, and they'll have some kind of a summit. Um, it's the idea of pulling everything back into the region, and this gets to another part of Brazilian leadership. You very rarely see Brazil standing up and telling other countries what to do. It will bilateralize what it, or multilateralize what it wants to do, find an organization through which it can channel uh, the sorts of things it wants to have happen. All right, so on the economic front, um, what does Brazil matter for South America? So really what this, this graph tells us is not a lot. You know, you're looking at a high in 2010 of about 7.2, 7.3 cents. Um, I'm looking at just South America because um, the, the Intel data website's not working very well at the moment, so it's hard to get data down. Um, not a lot of exports going into uh, Brazil from South America. Now, the data here is also skewed quite heavily because it's not broken down. If you switch this to Mercosur, you'll find more like 30 to 40 percent of exports are going into, into Brazil, where if you go to Peru, Colombia, Chile, you're going to get a much, much lower number. And again, this comes back to the geography. So if you've got the Andean countries all down one side, and then you have the Andes, which if anybody's been up there, it's fairly formidable geography to get products through. And so if you make it over the Andes, all of a sudden you wind up in a very large forest, which not got a lot of navigable rivers that have been developed for transportation. Road systems are not particularly good. Um, bridges over borders, bridges over rivers are not particularly good. So it's very difficult to get products from uh, the Andean countries into the Brazilian market and vice versa, which, which shifts what, the kind of things that get, that get sold. Um, so again, Brazil, very important for Argentina. Uh, it's, it's absolutely fundamental for Paraguay and Uruguay. Uh, without Brazil's market access, Paraguay and Uruguay are, are stone cold, dead in the water. And increasingly for Venezuela, uh, Brazil has become absolutely critical. It's one of the few places that uh, is actually able to get the bills paid. So companies have trouble getting their, their money out of Venezuela when they sold the products. The Brazilians are actually able to get the money out. And this comes down to presidential linkages. Um, and so it's a growing market. Why is Venezuela coming to Mercosur? Because it's a very good market for Brazil, and you want to protect that. Now, but this graph is the more telling one. So when you start to talk about what is being exported where, this is why Brazil matters more for South America, perhaps. So if you're exporting raw materials, uh, as Australia knows, you know, what, what's the value added? What's the employment generating capacity of a mine? I mean, it definitely has a big economic impact. I mean, we all know that. I mean, we, the, essentially, the funding for this conference is proof of, of, of that. But where's the follow on? How do you create mass employment off a mineral based economy or natural resource based economy? It doesn't create the manufacturing jobs, which then trickle down into more service jobs. What does do that is the value added products. So when you take the raw material and you process it and build it into something, and this is where Brazil becomes very important for South America because the things that it imports from the region are dominated by natural resources. And again, even in this graph here, the data is skewed. Um, so if we go uh, because of the Andes, you still have to physically get the product to market. And it's just, you know, by the time you pay to get something over the Andes, you might as well bring it in from China It's good, uh, with, by air freight. If we break the data down even more and we start to look at what goes on with Mercosur, Mercosur is looking at 85% of its intra-block intra exports are value added, which means that for the big economy of Argentina and the smaller ones of Uruguay and Paraguay, Brazil is, is fundamental. Um, and this is the, the substance of the trade, trade disputes going on between Argentina and Brazil right now. It's over, uh, you know, Argentine claims that Brazil is flooding uh, Argentina with uh, subsidized and unfairly traded uh, consumer goods, a lot of white goods, consumer durables and so on. Of course, the Brazilians have turned around and said exactly the same thing about the Argentines. And in a free trade area, you now have a situation where uh, I think Brazil just put a complaint in the WTO against Argentina on some of these trading patterns. Um, the point being, 
this is why Brazil matters in a sense. It's a place where you could sell something that creates more employ employment. All right. Now, how about the region for Brazil? Is it important? Absolutely. Brazil's exports are only about 11% of Brazil's GDP. It's not probably about 12% now. It will depend on what the price of the commodities are. Let's swing it around a little. What's most interesting about Brazil, though, people talk about China being Brazil's most important trading partner, and that this is a security threat or a risk for, for Brazil because they're now dependent upon China. They're not. I mean, by saying that China is the most important trading partner for Brazil, you're talking 26, 27, 28 percent of exports. One of the things that started from the 1980s was a very conscious program of diversifying uh, Brazilian export patterns so that you, have, you become uh, non-dependent upon any one part of the world. And a lot of effort has gone into doing this. But when you look at what's being exported, China's buying raw materials. Uh, the United States and Europe, largely raw materials, but increasingly large quantities of manufactured and value added. But South America is like 80, 85 percent value added products. So machinery, airplanes, buses. Um, it was shoes until that industry got more or less closed down. Um, white goods. So it's creating a lot of uh, trickle on economic impact for the Brazilians. And again, this is why, why do you want to keep Mercosur? Because it's a framework within which you can actually retain some kind of access to the big Argentine market. Why do you bring Venezuela in? Because it's very difficult to import products into Venezuela from most of the world, but not if you're Brazilian and you've got them in your trade block. And that's a very big market now for Brazilian firms. It's also a very big market for the, the side of economic exchange that we don't talk about, uh, the empreteras, the big construction companies. Um, has anybody heard the names Quiroz, Galvao, Orobrecht, uh, OEA, uh, Andrade Gutierrez? These are enormous uh, transnational tr construction companies that if you walk around pretty much any city in Latin America and you look at the big construction sites, you're probably going to see one of these names somewhere on, on the hoarding around the building sites. Um, and they're funded by the Brazilian National Development Bank with export financing credits. So again, South America becomes a very important market. Okay, you also have the idea of political assertion out of Brazil. Um, what is Brazil doing South America in terms of South America? Well, it's got a very strong political presence now. Uh, regional management issues going back to the mid-1990s. Um, I was in, in Ecuador when the war with Peru was ended, in, formally in 1998. And yes, Fujimori and Mao Wad went to Washington to receive the official benediction from Bill Clinton. That entire thing was, was driven by the Brazilians. And it was more or less driven by the Brazilians going to the Peruvians saying, what would it take for you to end this war? And selling that as a uh, a brokered deal to the, the Ecuadorians and getting the thing finished. It's a major accomplishment. Nobody thought this was going to happen. It was, the deal was sealed in Brasilia, and I think the Itamarati Palace, the foreign ministry palace, and finished with a, you know, a, a symbolic boat journey from, uh, I think from Belém to Iquitos, up the Amazon. Massive pro-democracy pressure comes out of Brazil. Um, interesting thing to argue about would be whether that applies or not to the recent Paraguayan case, but Brazil has been very, very quick to put pressure to return to a democratic path throughout the region. The interesting thing is they've not done it necessarily in the way that you, until the Lula years, until the way you would have expected out of the United States or Australia or Britain by saying, return this leader. It's like, well, you've thrown him out. There's a reason that someone like Mawad or Gutierrez or Fujimori or, or Chavez is a problem. You need to return to the constitutional order. Find a way to develop your democracy in a way that makes sense to your country. So this is a bit of a, a, a different twist, which makes it acceptable to receive the pressure, but it's not telling you what you must do. It's telling you a process. And this fits with the idea that Brazil constantly does. It asserts sovereignty, respects sovereignty. It's almost a bottom line that you must always uh, assert sovereignty. And this turns, in turn, into an interesting quirk on the inter-American system. So why is UNISO important, important or CELAC, the, the, uh, the new community of Latin American and Caribbean nations? CELAC, as they used to joke, some of the people I talked to in the government of Canada, it's the OAS minus two plus one. So it's the organization of states minus Canada, because Canada is now more, you know, more or less a proxy for the U.S. in many ways, minus the U.S. and plus Cuba. And the, the centrality of, of CELAC and UNISOR is becoming even more evident. Uh, in Cochabamba, at the OAS General Assembly earlier this year, you had a de facto attempt by the Bolivarian bloc to shut down the OAS and to kill off the... Uh, Inter-American Human Rights Commission and the, the Press Complaints Commission and so on. That's not going to happen without Brazil sort of tacitly saying, yeah, we're okay with this. 
Um, summit of the Americas meeting in Cartagena, it's been pretty clear that the next summit won't happen unless Cuba's present. That's going to make sure that the U.S. is not interested in participating. So you have a, a, a reformation of the inter-American system, which comes down to the idea that we can manage South America, we'd like to manage Latin America, but there's an argument with Mexico about that, and we may not want to deal with Central America. So how do we keep the U.S. out without telling the U.S. it can't be involved? And how do we make people accept that maybe we can manage things internally without people expecting us to do all the things that the United States does? And so it's done through an interesting um, institutional dance. And you know, within this, one of the key things that remains is non-overt intervention. Now, it, it's definitely pushing the point to say that Brazil does not intervene in other countries. Um, but it definitely does not do it the same way you would see the U.S. Pressure is exerted. Um, we have the, uh, there's a, a pattern, if you talk to the security people, uh, about putting pressure on elites in Paraguay by varying the intensity of the patrolling of smuggling routes along the border. So one of the things that happened after Lugo was impeached, all of a sudden a couple of weeks later you have a new program in place to cut down on contrabanding and, and narcotic smuggling in the tri-border area. There's, there's patterns that start to emerge. Uh, quiet messages are given uh, on a person-to-person -person basis. It's, it's not an accident that uh, the current, I believe he's still the ambassador in La Paz, Marcel Biato, was the uh, diplomatic chief of staff for, uh, for Lula, and at the very center of the, the South American policy being run by Marco Aurelio Garcia. You had José Terceo, who was uh, the Eminence Gris for Lula, the, the backroom man, fixing the deals, running effectively shuttle diplomacy between Havana and Caracas, La Paz, and, uh, and uh, Brasilia. So the pressure is there, but it's done very quietly in a way that's not public. Um, oops, one and you've got, on top of this, growing regional development uh, activities as well. So there's a, a shift coming in how Brazil looks at the region. The idea that if we grow and everybody doesn't, we have a big problem. You already have a bit of an illegal immigration problem with uh, Bolivia, where they're trying to get garment workers back to Bolivia. Um, but the idea in Brazil increasingly is how do we get the rest of the region to go with us? So the Agencia Brasileira de Cooperação, lots of technical cooperation. If you go to the border regions, you find a very flexible approach to access to social services. So if you're Paraguayan and you want to walk across the street and use the, Bolivia, the Brazilian uh, schools, the Brazilian health system, fine. Not a problem. Uh, it's not that many people. The strategic decision has been made that it's easier just to let these people in and help bring the area along than to create a hard wall and, then a, and a security problem. Infrastructure financing. Okay, this is a commercial activity, absolutely. But if you're in Bolivia or Ecuador and you've got an infrastructure project that you want to do and you need to finance it in the international markets, you're not looking at good rates. But if you do it with a Brazilian company financed through the Export-Import Bank uh, in the Bayana de Essa, you're going to get something fairly close to LIBOR. So it brings the actual cost of doing, doing a project way down. And I, one of the things I need to follow up, um, and it's a very interesting idea, but I don't know how far it's progressed and worked. Uh, there was talk uh, over the last five years of doing what's called competitive import substitution. The idea being if you're buying something from Europe or from uh, the United States, and probably now even China, if you can get a similar product at a similar price point from someone in South America or Africa, why not buy it from them? And so the, you have government acting as matchmaker, sort of saying, you buy this, they produce this, you guys should talk. And then they're leaving it up to the, the companies to sort out what they do. Um, security management. Again, Brazil's starting to push into this area and take a role. Very interesting that uh, Cecil Amorib is now the, for, the defense minister. He was the foreign minister. One of the things he said, you know, would you be continuing on with Dilma as foreign minister? And he said, well, no, I'm a negotiator. The negotiations are done. It's now management. But he's now in defense. And this is where the negotiation actually happens. The 2008 uh, Politica de Defesa Nacional, if you go through the document in detail, it's almost a NATO-like framework, talking of trying to create a uh, pan-South American defense, interoperable defense system, which conveniently would probably involve buying a lot of Brazilian weapons. But the point being that you know, we've got Brazil at this coordinating role in the center. Um, South American Defense Council works with this in, in this context. So when you have a security problem erupt, a potentially very serious one, when the Colombian uh, armed forces bombed a base in Ecuador, rather than going to the OAS, rather than ha seeing things devolve quickly into a war, as Chavez has his tanks rolling towards the border, you have the South American Defense Council and UNASUR stepping in quite quickly and getting things calmed down. So you've got, you do have a regional security management issue now uh, taking place. Non-traditional security threats, not so smooth. Um, 
the sovereignty issue gets in the way with effectively dealing with narco trafficking. It gets in the way of dealing with human trafficking issues. It gets in the way with dealing with contraband. It's a problem for dealing with the environment. Um, I don't think this has been fully thought through yet. This is one of the things that needs to be talked about internally in Brazil. And if there was a major security threat, there is a capacity question. Can Brazil get troops quickly to any point that it needs to along the border? What will it do if there is some sort of a naval issue uh, involving the subsalt? Is the capacity in place? I mean, that, that's, a, again, an issue that's being sorted out. But at the moment, it doesn't seem to matter. So that brings us to sort of today. Um, what the point is to today and tomorrow. So what is, you know, there's a lot, a growing body of study in Brazilian leadership in Portuguese and in English, but it's not talking so much about the reactions back. It's still looking at the expression of the foreign policy out. Um, we're not asking questions about will Brazil really lead, how other countries are reacting to it. You know, the Pacific Alliance, why are Peru, Chile, Colombia, and Mexico looking west across the Pacific as opposed to east over the Andes in such a clear and focused manner? It's a very big question. I mean, yes, China is an important market for them, but what about doing something with Brazil? Why is it going in that direction? Um, Argentina and Mexico, uh, of course, have serious doubts about Brazil's bid for a UN Security Council permanent seat. Um, there's I don't think there's ever going to be a complete easing of tensions with Argentina and things like that. And you've got Brazil asking, acting in an increasingly muscular manner throughout the region. Um, trade disputes with Argentina uh, are very forceful. A close, what I would call, well, I'm calling consultative here, uh, role with Bolivia. Um, I think it probably goes quite a bit deeper than that. Um, same thing in Ecuador. You've seen the same sort of thing to a certain extent in, in Venezuela, but much quieter. Paraguay, Miguel might disagree with me a bit on this. Um, you've got management of Hugo Chavez. And I think we'd use the word management deliberately. It's almost like the United States and Canada inter-American meetings, like police, just find a way to harness them. To a certain extent, that has happened. And you know, it seems to be almost like a quasi-judgmental role about what goes in countries like Paraguay. So it's clear that Brazil's having an impact, but the question is how and, and what are the reactions that are coming back? Okay. And that would be it. <laughs> Yeah, I, I wouldn't put it in the context of negotiation. I wouldn't so much say the financing of the infrastructure. I mean, that's kind of the back end, the commercial imperative for Brazil. Because if you look at those roads, uh, there was the one through Bolivia recently that had the indigenous protest. It was funded by the Bayana de Asse, and it was run by a Brazilian construction company. It's more, one of the things that pops up consistently is the idea from Bolivian and Peruvian governments that, well, we can become a, a logistics hub for Brazil, or a logistics hub in Central America. We're centrally located in a spot, and everything can come through us. Like, fine, but you have to get over the Andes. And you know, while all of this stuff was being talked about formally in the foreign ministry in, in 2000, 2001, and the planning ministry uh, by the people running at IRSA, they're saying, yeah, no, we've got all these, the soya being, being grown in the west of Brazil, and we can just put it in the trucks and take it over the Andes, and then we can send it off. It's, so, soya is a bulk commodity. You don't tr ship soya by truck unless you're crazy. Uh, maybe if you built a railway line across, but again, the the, the engineering feat of getting over the Andes is, is astounding. You put it in a boat. So the bulk of what Brazil wants to send to Asia actually needs to go by boat. So you just put it on something, float it down the, uh, the Pantanal water system, and, and take it out through Santos or Paranago or somewhere like that. But it's this idea that, well, hey, we could have this link. We could have this, this central point. And it's this carrot that we'll, we, we could become a very important part of Brazil's access to or the logistical distribution of. And you know, it make, makes some sense. I mean, if you look at uh, hub points in, in Europe, for example, it, it can give a very good, strong founding. So it's, a, that, it's in that sense that it's a carrot. That, like, tying it to negotiations, I haven't done that yet. It's an interesting idea, though. I thought you mentioned that. There's yeah. probably something going on. Uh, Brazilians or Brazilians, the dominance is already in fact that regional 
Well, like the Brazilian regional dominance is not going away. Or dominance or dominance is not the right word, is it? Um, <laughs> Brazilian re regional uh, preeminence, um, to, to use the correct language. Um, but it, uh, it's not going to go away. It's not something they can ignore because it is politically and economically so important. The, the investment plans that the government's announced, I think there's two things going on there. One of them is definitely economic stimulus, right? You want, you want to keep the economy going. But who here has traveled through Brazil recently? <coughs> Has anyone gone through Guarulhos Airport? You know, it's, it's, yeah, exactly, too many times and you sit there and you just think, oh, God, no. Um, the infrastructure of Brazil, particularly transportation infrastructure, is horrific. Um, if you go into a place like Fiespe, and Fiespe will say, look, forget the trade deals, open up the markets, let's go. But you've got to do two things first. Fix the taxes so we understand how they work and fix the infrastructure so we can get the product to market. Um, I mean, Morok, I remember you telling me a story about five or six years ago of a strike at the ports where the workers went on strike, management went, hell, we know how to run the cranes and ran it anyways, and efficiency went up without the workers um, <laughs> and without the unions in place. So that, that's the kind of problem. So this is what Dilma's partly trying to get at. How do you get the airports fixed fast? And they have two years, right? The World Cup's in two years. And you need to be able to get large volumes of people through. And, uh, Belo Horizonte, they're telling me, if you're coming for a game, come a week early and sleep at the stadium. That's the only way you're going to get in with your ticket. Um, I think that's a bit extreme, but uh, you know that, that is the nature of the problem. Three days instead of five. Three days? Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>